Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. This is not a Gibson Les Paul Custom. It kind of is, but not at the same time. Today, we're going to discuss the mysterious brand Orville by Gibson. So in case you've never heard of this before, Orville by Gibson was a brand licensed out by Gibson to two Japanese factories. They were made in Fujigen and Terada. And these things existed from 1988 until 1998, so they had a good 10 year run. But why did Gibson have to sell out their name to a Japanese factory anyways? Well, first we need to do a little bit of history. So the 70s and 80s, it was a dark period for both Gibson and Fender. Within Gibson history, the brand was just sold, you are now under Norlin ownership. And during their time of ownership of Gibson, there was a lot of cost cutting techniques featured and the guitars just changed a lot. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad guitars. 70s, 80s Les Pauls are some of my favorite ones because they're affordable and they have a really cool vintage vibe to them. But you can't deny that they're super different from their 50s counterparts. And Fender kind of has a similar story behind them of the quality just not being there. So a lot of copycat companies emerged and were ripping off Gibson, Fender, and other brands' designs because they could do them cheaper and in some situations even better. For example, brands that were doing that include Ibanez, Tokai, Bernie, Greco, even Electra. I've covered a few of those on my channel. Some of them are absolute garbage, you know, the lower tiered ones, they were just made to look good and they not necessarily be good. But then there were some really good high end ones. And that's kind of where the trouble began because people would be purchasing those over the USA made counterparts. And that hurt both Gibson and Fender. It's not a coincidence that both of those companies were sold to new ownership in the mid 80s. But what do you got to do? You got to fight back. And sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. So in 82, Fender opened a Japanese division. And that was oversaw by Yamano Gaki, which was the largest Japanese dealer at the time. And Kanda Shokai, which was the largest Japanese manufacturer of musical instruments. But Gibson started toying around in the Japanese market actually in the early 70s under their Epiphone brand name. But that was headed up by people that also made the Aria guitars, and that contract ended in 1983, and all Epiphones were then switched over to the Korean plants. And Gibson and Yamato, you know, the same one from the Fender Japan, they partnered up and created something called Orville, and Orville by Gibson. Now, why did they call this Orville? That's kind of a strange name, right? Well, it goes back to the very start of this company, Gibson, in 1894. The founder of the company, his name is Orville Gibson. So if he ever knew that there was a guitar brand, Orville by Gibson, he'd be like, what? My middle name's not by. <laughs> That's kind of a cool little history fact that I appreciate that. But essentially, the reason why they made these guitars was to fill a gap in the market. You had the entry-level Korean Epiphones, and then you had the USA-made Gibsons. There's this area right here where they needed to fill that gap so other competitors doesn't steal your sales. So they created the Orville lineup. So there's kind of three tiers to Orville, but only two main ones. There's the ones that were branded just Orville. I had somebody in the unboxing episode say, oh, I wish it didn't say by Gibson because then it would look better. This is actually the higher end tier. These were supposed to have nitro finishes, long neck tenons, Japanese PAFs, or even Gibson humbuckers within these stock. Whereas the lower end ones that just said Orville, there's two different versions of those, ones with sticker serial numbers and ones with ink stamps. The ink stamped ones are a little bit higher quality, but those will have lesser quality pickups. I mean, they're still gonna be decent. They'll have the short neck tenon and poly finishes, but that's just a very brief overview of these. So if you're looking at one that says Orville by Gibson, you can rest assured that that's the higher end one that had more time put into it and potentially nicer graded parts. But there were a lot of changes that happened with these guitars over their 10 years of production. I'm not necessarily an expert. This is just kind of a brief overview, compiling all the information that I could find. But nowadays you can find these on the used market ranging anywhere between about 700 to about $1,200. I mean, there's some limited edition ones out there that fetch crazy money. That's actually the first time I ran into this brand is I love the Spotlight Special model. And in 1994, they did like three of them. 
and it was an Orville by Gibson. I think it's still for sale today. It's at $4,000. I almost bought it, but I'm really glad I didn't because I think moving that would have been very difficult. But it's not just Les Paul Customs. They made Juniors, they did Specials, they did Les Paul Customs, ES styled guitars, SGs, basses, 59 reissue Les Pauls. Those are some of the more expensive ones. Firebirds, Flying Vs, Explorers. I mean, if Gibson made it, they pretty much made it too. So it's just kind of an interesting time period for Gibson here, but eventually they just dropped this brand and went with Epiphone. That's when you get things like the full-sized headstock Epiphones, and then they went to the Alita series. Then they kind of moved it into what it's still kind of known as for today. You could have learned all that information by just doing a few little searches. The reason why people wanted me to review one of these is because I'm the guy that's documented more or less Pauls than anybody on YouTube. So they wanted to see what were the actual differences to someone like me who knows all those acute little things. But to fully make sense of this one, we're gonna have to throw it on the workbench to take a deeper look. Inside the Orville by Gibson. Now, I do want to say that this is a 1989 second year production from the Tirada factory, so there might be some differences between the factories and later year models, but this is only true for this 89. So what we've got going on here is kind of interesting. It's a three-piece maple top, so that's still symbolizing Gibson's old ways, how they were doing it kind of in the 80s before they switched back to the two-piece tops. But what's also kind of cool here is they're actually going after 50 specs. I mean, do you see the top carve on this thing? It is much more pronounced than it would be on a Gibson of this era. You also have things like the thin binding in the cutaway. And as we'll see, once we take this neck pick about, you have a long neck tenon. So those are all things that this would have over like a 90s era Gibson Les Paul. But let's take a closer look here. You're going to notice, huh, Gibson USA, the original. If you've been watching the channel, we've seen these before. These are actually Gibson pickups, and these were only in Gibson guitars from very late 1987 through very early 1990. These were designed by Bill Lawrence. They're called the original circuit board pickups. So you'll see by these connectors here, you can technically coil split these pickups if you want to. It doesn't appear that we have any fancy electronics in here, though. But an easy way to tell that you have Bill Lawrence the original pickups without even taking them out are these large screws for adjusting the height of them. The earlier ones anyways will always have that identifying characteristic. Within the circuit, the bridge pickup reads 13.56k ohms. Your neck position is 7.27. And then your middle, just for fun, 4.73. The pickups in this guitar are worth around 200 to 300 bucks. Depends on how bad somebody wants them. I mean, I guess you could scalp it for as much as 400, but I mean, these things are in pretty good shape. As you can see, long neck tenon, and inside here, you can see it is a full width maple top. It's not a thin veneer or anything, and it sits on top of a mahogany body right there. I mean, if they were going to veneer this, they probably would have done a two-piece veneer instead of a three-piece, but <laughs> who knows? But the pickup cavity routes look pretty good and similar as to what you would find normally. You even have the shielded braided wiring coming from the toggle switch. But here's some differences. You can see that these pickup rings are much bulkier than they normally are on a Gibson. And they feel a little bit cheaper. Just for comparison, here's what an 80s pickup ring would look like. You can see it's much thinner in profile, but I mean, this is probably going more so towards 50 spec. I'm not necessarily saying one's better than the others, but it's definitely not what you would find on a Gibson from this era. And now another difference, the bridge. You can see the posts are metric in style. However, the things that actually sit on it, you can put an original Gibson bridge on here. Because this is what one of those would look like. It would read made in Germany, made by Schaller. I mean, this is not the bridge that was on it, but here you can see you could fit an original Gibson bridge on here if you wanted to. But what was on this one, and I'm not even sure if it's original, is a Godo part. And those are made in Japan, so I guess it would make sense if it was original. And when I got the guitar, it's technically on upside down. In the back side of the tailpiece, it just looks like this. A Gibson one would just have a single tooling line mark down the center. It's not lightweight, it's not super heavy either. But something that is different here is the toggle switch, the way it's mounted. You see how that ring, it's kind of Epiphone in style. It comes around it and secures it right there. Gibsons kind of have a skirted knob that goes down inside to make that less of a profile. You can also see that the rhythm treble was printed slightly off center. It's just something I noticed that kind of annoys me. But then once again, the beautiful top carve, that's definitely a cool selling point for these guys. 
and you also have the 50s thumb bleeder knobs and you've got speed knobs on this one and with the pickguard taken off you can see that these definitely mount in a slightly different location than a Gibson because they're usually pretty centered there in between the ring and here and the pickguard itself is really different it's actually only four ply and it feels thicker than a regular Gibson one despite a Gibson one actually being five ply but a cool little feature that I'm not even sure if it's stock or not, there's this little rubber bumper right here that prevents it from indenting into the finish. However, if this was a nitro finish, I'd be scared that this rubber bumper would affect it. I'm almost confident this one has a poly finish, just by the way the dings look on this, and I did the acetone test on a very discreet location in here, and it did not dissolve, so I am pretty confident this is a poly finish. Our next differences lie within the neck. So it's still a mahogany body with a maple top, right? But this, instead of being ebony, I am nearly 100% positive that this is rosewood. It's got lots of wood grain and it's got that nice dark rosewood color. But you're gonna notice these inlays, they're nice, crisp, and white. That's because they're acrylic. They're not real mother of pearl like you would find on the Gibson variants of this time. And that's a little bit striking. It's something that I definitely noticed right away because it's like, huh, these things are way too bright looking as compared to what I'm used to seeing. But you'll also notice that you don't have the fret nibs, the little plastic bits that run over the tops of the frets. Now, apparently some of these Orville by Gibsons can have that. However, I wouldn't be surprised if this one was actually refretted at one point in time because there's slight gaps at the ends of the frets. I tried hammering them down to no avail, so they're a little bit sharp, but it doesn't seem to affect the way the guitar plays too much. But it is possible these are the original frets. You can see you've actually got some considerable fret wear right here. And I noticed while playing this guitar, granted, keep in mind, this was before I polished it all up and oiled the fretboard and stuff. These frets seem to grab your strings more and made like a nail on the chalkboard like sound. It wasn't super smooth like on the Gibson variant. So I'm hoping that polishing job will change the way that feels. But this guitar sounds brighter acoustically. And I think it's because of the fret wire material. It must be different. Now you're probably curious, huh? Where did our nut go? This nut has definitely been replaced. Somebody did a bone nut on here and it wasn't actually glued down, so I just took it off. But you can see it is created in the same Gibson style. You've got your mahogany neck with your maple cap coming over your truss rod. And I was kind of surprised to see a Gibson style truss rod. It's not exactly the same, but you still use the Gibson style tool in order to adjust it. But do you notice something weird about this nut slot? No binding here, but you still have binding there. I'm guessing that's just a factory mess up, but it made the nut replacement job very difficult on the guy because he had to actually cut it at an angle. <laughs> but it seems to work okay, so I don't think an immediate replacement is really needed. But there you can see how on this side you don't have the binding and this side you do. But it is nice to see that there is that gap like the way Gibson does it because the Epiphones usually just have a big area of binding right there so they don't have to worry about the differences. The truss rod cover itself, it might not look different, but it is different. It's actually only two ply. So this truss rod is more akin to like an Epiphone guitar where they have these little two ply things. Then onto the headstock, again, you have the pearloid material, so it's not quite as shiny as the mother of pearl as you would find on the overlays of Gibsons. And then there you can see the Orville by Gibson branding. Epiphones also had an Epiphone by Gibson. I'm always curious why they didn't center that. I think that throws some people off by the way that it looks like that. But you will notice a defect on the headstock right here. I'm guessing the lacquer has bubbled or off-gassed a little bit since it was made. And it kind of has this cream hue right here. You can see that along the side of the headstock right there too. But then down here you can see those lines become much more clear. I get a skinny 1.65 inch nut width, which increases to 2.03 at the 12th. First fret neck depth is 0.84. Then it reads 0.97 by the 12th. It's still a rather thin feeling neck though. It definitely doesn't feel as thick as it says it is up here. And they're going for that 24 and 3 quarter inch scale. The back side of this instrument is what I was most interested to take a look at. Because the big scare about these things are they look so much like a Gibson Les Paul. What if somebody just took a Gibson Les Paul veneer and put it over there? And it's happened. People have scammed people by doing that because swapping that out really isn't that hard to do if you're going to make a thousand bucks off of someone. So it comes out to the control cavity route. I mean, this looks fairly similar, but something that I notice right away that's different is the way the woods routed out underneath here to make the short shaft pots fit. So it doesn't use long shaft pots. They actually modify the wood in order to make those fit. 
but it looks like we have some sort of 500k pot in here with little June bug capacitors. So it doesn't look like anything super fancy or high end here. It's mainly just your pickups that got upgraded. But that's a pretty nice looking cavity here. The three way toggle switch actually looks a little bit more professional than the Gibsons. But here's why I think the finish is poly because of the way the finish dents. I mean, that's a pretty large gash and the finish is just kind of cracked around it. You've got a few of those areas on this guitar. I mean, that's a massive ding. I'm not even sure what would even cause it. You've got a few light ones right here on the mahogany neck, but then you've got some more major ones right here, the way it's indented. You got one right there. And then there's this. This was sold to its owner as just a finish crack. No, that's actually a crack in the wood. And you can see the area of impact right here, so it must have dinged up against something right there, and that caused a light fracture right here. Now, it's probably never been repaired. It doesn't necessarily need repaired right away. Then the headstock, they got the nice keystone tuner tips, but they're made in Japan. I mean, they don't feel like bad quality tuners or anything, but they're not Grover branded. And now our serial number. G, if you have a G, that means you have Gibson pickups in it, and it's made in the Tanada factory. And then the next two digits, 8-9, tell you the year it was made, 1989. And then that's your production number, 7,874, so you can tell there's a boatload of these things out there. There's a bunch of different serial number formats, so it depends on what years yours was made. So I'll leave a link in the description to a nice little article that kind of explains more. Something else kind of interesting here, the back plates are actually multi-ply. <laughs> the back is white, and the same is true for the toggle switch cover. Interesting. Moving on to the side, the pickguard bracket. You see how the screw actually sticks out right there? That's not how the Gibsons go. They more go inside of it, so they won't stick out as much as that. So that's a small difference. You still have your metal output jack plate. That's a nice little touch. And then your strap buttons just look like this, slightly different from the Gibson variants. This one weighs nine pounds, three and a half ounces. So it's not overly heavy, but it's not too light for a Les Paul. It's like right where you would expect. And honestly, slightly under what most of the Gibsons of this era would weigh. They average about 10 pounds. So let's go ahead, plug this thing in and hear how it sounds.
now that we know just about everything about this Orville by Gibson guitar, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I hate to say it, it wasn't my favorite guitar in the world. I think I was overhyped on these by reading about them online. A lot of people going, oh yeah, they're Gibson killers, things like that. Uh, yeah, it falls a little bit short if you think this is going to be better than a Les Paul Custom. But it does have some pros and some cons, so I made a little list here. First off, my goodness, this guitar is so beautiful for the price. That dish carve really just makes this guitar illuminate. On top of that, you have a really cool blend of 50s and modern specs on these instruments, and that's really nice to see. Now, I know most people have probably looked down upon this one for having a three-piece top, but I personally dig it because it says late 80s, early 90s Gibson before they fix that. And on top of that, the full-sized headstock, it just looks so good. If you're not looking at the headstock, Anybody who sees you playing this, they're just going to think you're playing a Gibson. But as a Les Paul aficionado, there's a lot of small things that definitely catch my eye that make me go, yeah, I'm not actually playing a Gibson. But the biggest thing of a guitar is the neck and how it feels. Unfortunately, this one has a fatal flaw to me. It's a rather bright guitar when you're playing it. I mean, just listen to it acoustically. That was the very first thing I noticed about this guitar when I was strumming it. And until this day, when I heard people talking like when they get stainless steel frets that it changes the tone, I thought they were just crazy. But now I think I'm a believer that fret material definitely has a huge impact on tone. And I say that because I really hate this fret wire. I think that's the reason why it's bright sounding. It's also very grabby. Remember how I was talking on the bench that I was hoping polishing these frets up was gonna fix that? Unfortunately, it didn't. Listen to this. It's not necessarily that it's hard to play, it's just you definitely feel a lot more give on these frets. But whatever's actually making this guitar so bright, it definitely translates when you plug it in. I found that these pickups almost overpowered my amp, and I actually, you know, lowered them pretty low here, so it's not just because they're right up against the strings or anything. And that kind of made it sound muddy and distorted at times. But, you know, I mean, it really depends what you're going for. Sometimes a bright attacking sound can be good. You just have to dial your amp in to compensate for it. And the other thing I want to talk about with this neck is it feels like it's a flatter radius than a regular Gibson. Like this just feels like a flat fretboard. Now I don't actually have like a radius gauge to prove that. That's just what I feel playing this thing, but that's, not necessarily a bad thing either. I thought doing chords high up like this, very comfortable on this guitar. So that's something to keep in mind. So if you can afford the real deal Gibson Les Paul Custom, definitely go for it. Orville by Gibson didn't really live up to the hype in my opinion, but it definitely does the job that it was meant to do. It was supposed to be that middle ground between Gibson Les Paul and Epiphone. So I can definitely see why there are fans of this model and it's a great modding platform. So that concludes my review of this Orville by Gibson Les Paul Custom. Maybe I'll give these another try another day. Maybe something's just off about this one. But let's go ahead and quickly go over the condition just for fun. Again, you've got some scratches on the headstock and that weird yellowing to it. Your nut's been replaced. You've got some fret wear, potential refret. I'm not 100% sure myself. And the face of the guitar, it's got some micro scratches on here, but I polished it up a little bit. Nothing too crazy here, but the gold hardware is actually in pretty good shape here. And you've got your original Gibson pickups in here. As far as the headstock goes, you do have a light ding at the top, and then you kind of got that partial crack right here. And then you've got the nicks and dings on the neck. <laughs> so it was definitely somebody's player for quite a while. I mean, having fret wear on a guitar like this means it was played. And you've got some buckle scratches on the back here, and then that large ding right there. And you also have some dings along the edges of the instrument. Again, you do have that thin binding in the cutaway, and there's actually one of the strap buttons that has been moved. It's not this bottom one, there's that big ding, but the strap button that was moved is at the top. You can see at one point in time, somebody moved it back a little bit, and then they changed their mind and filled it back in. 
So let's go ahead and take a look under black light. So it looks like we've got a lot glowing on here. Ha ha, funny joke. <laughs> oh, so the binding glows a lot more. So that kind of reminds me of Epiphone and other poly finished guitars. But you know, it's just kind of cool to see this glow under the black light here. I don't really see anything too crazy going on. Oh, it looks like we got a little bit of finish worn through right there. That's impressive. Take a look under here. Yeah, everything's looking cool. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> that's a thing. Now, as far as cases go, from my research, there only appears to have been Orville by Gibson branded gig bags. So most of these you'll find have aftermarket hard shell cases. This one has a gator case. So you got a couple of latches on here. These aren't the best cases in the world, but they do the job. This one's actually a little bit better than most because it has additional padding right here and more padding than I've seen in most of these for the heel support too. But I hope your troglodytes enjoyed getting to learn about the Orville by Gibson brand. It was fun getting to learn about it and check this guitar out. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.